Hello everybody and welcome to my review of volume number two of Sakon Kaido's light novel series Infinite Dendrogram. This one is available in ebook format only at this time via J Novel Club. In the first volume of Infinite Dendrogram what really drew me in was first of all the writing itself. It's a really well written series. It is written in the first person primarily from Ray's point of view. It does shift a little bit here and there, but the vast majority it is from Ray's point of view, his first person point of view. But the fight scenes are well executed because the battle system is more uh, fantastical, like it's more of a living world. It means that they are fast paced, that you don't get bogged down in a lot of heavy game mechanics, but there's certainly enough jargon and such there that it still feels like a game. And one of the really interesting and engaging, and for me as a gamer, one of the things I thought was really cool, is the whole embryo system, which is a item that all the players get that develops unique to the player themselves and levels up along with them, offering them different sorts of weapons and so forth. And for Ray, it is a maiden type, which means that he has a weapon that is a sword, but it turns into a cute young girl named Nemesis. So in volume one, I found that it was really the game and sort of introducing myself to this world that really pulled me in and made me interested in. The other thing that I kind of thought was interesting and engaging about it was the fact that Infinite Dendrogram is meant to model after a living world. So the actions that are done by players are permanent. So if an NPC dies in the game, they are dead. That's it. They don't come back. They don't respawn. Even if they were someone who gave a quest, it doesn't matter. They're gone. Things like forests being burned down, they stay burned down. They don't just respawn automatically after a short given time period. So it is this living thing. And as I said in my first video as a gamer, I thought, you know, this is really cool. Like, I would love to get involved in something like this. But the question is, what drives the series forward? And what makes this series interesting and engaging beyond that? Like, is it just going to be monster fighting? Is it just going to be dungeon diving? So I was very interested to see where Volume 2 took this whole thing. And so Volume 2 continues all of those elements from Volume 1, of course, that I thought were really good. The good writing, it's got lots of action pieces, the character of Ray is just this decent guy, he's a good guy, he's powerful but not OP to the point where it's being ridiculous. In fact, we kind of start finding out why maybe he's the way he is. I don't want to give it away because I thought it was kind of interesting, but in Volume 1, they make comment that the Maiden-type embryos, like a Nemesis, are quite rare. They're not unique, but they are rarer. And we find out why perhaps Ray has one of these, and it speaks a lot to who he is as a person. This volume does a lot to kind of expand Ray's character, gives us a little bit more backstory on Ray, but it introduces what I think is one of the, going to be one of the central themes. It's certainly the theme of this volume, and I can see it growing and expanding over the rest of the series, is this theme of if you have a world that is modeled after a living world, inhabited by NPCs who have an AI where they think for themselves, they live a life themselves, they grow, they develop, they learn, they interact. What kind of reaction do those people then have to players? This is one aspect. So how can an NBC, NPC who sees these players who they are immortal, so if they die, they come back three days later, whereas the NPCs, death is permanent. These players have the embryos, which make them incredibly strong and powerful. And in the case of a lot of the players, probably the vast majority, this is a game. They, they don't take things as seriously. Like, their decisions of what to take part in are based more on a gamer's aesthetic than they are on loyalty or even morality, per se. So, 
how do NPCs, how does that influence their opinion of the masters, the ones that are the gamers? How do they see them? What kind of lengths would it drive them to, to try and push themselves beyond their own limits, to try and catch the masters, to aspire to be as powerful as the masters? And in sort of tandem with that, and connected to the idea of what I said in terms of how the NPCs view them as people who don't take this world seriously, there is that question, too, where if you are a gamer, from the gamer's point of view, you're in this world. You can log out anytime you want. There's no real impact to you as a person, to your life. You can log out and walk away from the game and never come back, and there's really no negative against you. So, how do you view this world? How do you interact with it? Do you take it upon yourself to do something that is hard and difficult and may not have a great reward because it is the right and moral thing to do? Or do you ignore those things and, like I said, take it a more of a gamer point of view and sort of say, well, I want high return type things or I want low risk type things because you know, perhaps my level or what have you, that that the way of thinking as a gamer when you're inside a world is very, very different from the way that a person who lives in that world permanently would think about it and how there's creating this conflict and how it's sort of driving a lot of actions behind the scenes that, again, I, I don't want to get into spoilers, but but you can sort of see where this series is becoming interesting on sort of a philosophical level because we haven't seen a lot of VR MMOs that involve non-player characters. The closest thing I think that we have, um, we have Log Horizon, which of course, when the players find themselves in the new world that is like the Log Horizon game, there are NPCs that are now living beings. But the whole thing is, is that the players are aware that this is a real world and that these NPCs are now real people. So there's a different level of treatment. It's the same thing with like the NPCs in Overlord, right? The NPCs, Ainz now acknowledges them as living beings. He, he does not see them as being NPCs. And for both those cases, it isn't a situation where they can just log out and walk away. And if they get upset by the game, they can just say, well, I'm done with it and walk away and lead their rest of their lives. It's not the way it works. Whereas in Infinite Dendrogram, it does. Because this is still just a game. It's not a death game like Sword Art Online. It's not a trapped in a game-like world. It is literally just some dude who is in his living room plugged in to a video game and playing it. Which... It does, like I said, it just makes it very interesting. And as a guy who plays a lot of RPGs, which often will allow you to have some freedom of choice, it does sort of start to make you question yourself too, where you're sort of sitting there thinking, wow, you know, as a gamer, what kind of choices do I make when I play a more open world type RPG? Do I sort of put things aside and say, mm, I'll get back to that? What would it change my opinion if there was a time limit? So one of the ones that I, I, I played so much was Skyrim. It's probably the, and it's probably the closest that we have in terms of an open world with NPCs and all these different quest lines and everything else. And you could do things at your own pace and everything else. What, what would my experience have been like in that game if, I could only do a quest once. I had to do it exactly at the time that it became available. And if I decided to do that, how would I feel knowing that it meant I couldn't do other quests at the same time? In most RPGs, even open world RPGs, I can start one quest and then in the middle of it, start another one and the rest of the quest will wait for me. But Infinite Dendrogram isn't like that. You have to make a choice and you have to commit to it. So it's a very, very different headspace, I think, in terms of gaming. And I'm, 
I was really interested to sort of see how this was playing out. And I mean, we got a bit of a glimpse of this in the first volume when we found out that the Altair Kingdom had lost in that war and that many of its masters, particularly the superior masters, didn't take part in the war. And we saw some of those hard feelings and mistrust because of that situation. This book takes it to the next step. So it is a continuing theme and a continuing idea that I found really, really engaging and it really drew me into this book. Now, I should say right off the bat, this is probably one of the darker novels that we have that involves a VR MMO. Yep, even darker than Sword Art Online. I mean, the original Aincrad storyline, yeah, if you died in the game, you died for real. Um, oh my, they're teenagers and they might die. This one, this book starts. Now, this is hardly even a spoiler because we're talking the first, like, four pages. This book starts with children being murdered, dismembered, and consumed. It is dark. <laughs> the, the, the whole main storyline of this is this gang that does this to children, kidnaps them, ransoms, ransoms them, and for the most part doesn't even return them, kills them, and, like... It's a little bit shocking right out of the gate because volume one, even though it was, even though it didn't strike me as being a series that was going to be sugary happy time all the time, it didn't quite strike me that it was going to get that dark and right out of the gate. Like I said, first five pages, a kid gets murdered. Like, I mean, it's, it's a little heavy and uh, depending on how you feel about that kind of stuff, well, it might influence how you feel about this book, particularly this volume. But again, like I said, it's setting up in a very, very heavy way this whole theme of players and their attitudes towards things that go on in the game and how those attitudes alter because this is a game world to them. So Infinite Dendrogram, really good second volume. In fact, I'd say there were certain parts of it that I thought were better than volume number one. I I like the path that it is taking. I enjoy how Ray's character is being developed and built up. Even like the some of the backstory about him, it explains quite a bit about him and kind of explains his relationship with his brother outside of the game, which I hope we see more of because that dynamic in the first book and then what we see of them in the real world in sort of raise memories and stuff in this second book. They have a really cool relationship and I would like to see more of it and to see it get expanded even more so. So Infinite Dendrogram, I really, well, obviously, you know, I liked this second volume quite a bit. I really enjoyed it. And it is definitely something that I'm going to continue to read. And I, cause I really want to see sort of how these themes and ideas play out over the next couple books uh, there's a whole lot of, there's this one major sort of subplot that I think is going to be very interesting to see how it goes going forward and how it will play out, particularly with these themes of masters and NPCs and everything else. So I really recommend it if uh, you have been kind of shy on the idea that you're like, do I really want to read another VR MMO book or game, a book about a guy playing a video game? Do I really want to read that? I think this one is definitely worth the shot, uh, even if you've been a little bit hesitant or maybe you've shied away from them all together because you heard bad things about Sword Art Online or what have you. This is not Sword Art. It's very, very different, and it is very, very good so far. It'll be very interesting to see where we go from here. So those are my thoughts on volume number two of Infinite Dendrogram. If you want to pick this book up, I do have a link for Amazon.com.ca and .uk in the description. Clicking through that link and buying whatever gets me about 4 to 5% of a commission, which I use that money to then buy more books so I can review them here on the channel. So my next review, I'm going to be starting to play a little bit of catch up with a series that I have lagged behind in. I've got a couple series that are like that, actually. But the first one that I'm going to be doing it with is The Rising of the Shield Hero. It's been quite a while since I've read a volume of these. Uh, I really liked this series, uh, especially when it first came out. 
it was a very different main character than what we had had in many of the other isekai type light novels. So it was kind of refreshing and I enjoyed it quite a bit. So looking forward to getting back to these characters and sort of seeing how the story develops going forward. So if you love light novels and you're new to the channel, you should consider subscribing. I do two to three reviews every single week and I also do a weekly countdown of the top 10 best-selling light novels in Japan. Thank you all for joining me in this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Till then, bye bye for now.